Journey, we are starting a brand new series. Who's excited about that? Anybody in the room? I'm excited to jump into this brand new series, Anxious About Nothing. Listen to me, I need you to be excited during this message. If you've never met me before, I'm a little eccentric in ADD, and uh, and I like to have fun. Um, so I, I would expect from you guys that you want to have fun when you come to church. And so when the gospel goes forth today, we want to celebrate what God is doing in the hearts and the lives of the people around us. Amen? And so we need you, I need you to work with me and be excited as we jump into this first week of Anxious About Nothing. Now listen, if you deal with anxiety in any form, this series is for you. Uh, if you're watching online, if you're if you're in the room, can you do me a favor? If you've ever experienced anxiety in any in any form, can you raise your hand? Anybody? For those not raising their hand, keep them up real quick. For those not raising their hand, they have so much anxiety right now, they do not want to raise their hand. <laughs> I'm not raising my hand. Uh. <laughs> Listen, the reason why I say that is because we are now in agreement. If you're watching online and you raised your hand, if you type that into the chat. Uh, we're all in agreement that we all experience anxiety in some form or fashion. Uh, today's message, we're going to be unpacking this subject of anxiety uh, with the message title, Perspective of Praise. Perspective of Praise. And the reason why I've entitled that is because a lot of us, we come at uh, moments in our life, certain situation, our marriage, including me, uh, we come at we come at difficult moments from anxiety and depression and worry and doubt and we forget how big God is and how much he loves us and how big his plans for our life are. And so we're going to be talking about that that perspective of praise, looking at things from a perspective of praise in our life. Now before we jump in, I want to acknowledge a few things. Number one, this message was inspired by a few incredible leaders uh, that I study from afar, Craig Rochelle, Max Acato. They have a book, Craig Rochelle has a book called uh, Winning the Battle of the Mind. And then Max Acato has another book, uh, Anxious About Nothing. And so a lot of what we hear today is not my words as far as uh, what is being said, but it is, it is directly from their textbook because it is so incredibly powerful. Um, but also, I want to recognize this, that anxiety is a very, very complex subject. And I know that there are people in the room, there's people watching online. As we jump into a series like this, you're thinking, well, I deal with it from a medical, it's a medical diagnosis. And here's what I want you to know. I know that that's real. We understand that those are real things, medically diagnosed, chemically imbalanced. We understand that that's a real thing. But because I'm not qualified to speak to a medical diagnosis, I'm going to unpack this today. We're going to do this together from a biblical standpoint, because here's what I personally believe. Regardless of whether you deal with anxiety because of a medical diagnosis or you just deal with it because it's something we deal with every single day, I always believe that it is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle that we are in daily to keep our eyes off of the Father and on our circumstances. So we're going to jump into this topic, perspective of praise. Let's pray first, okay? Hey, God, we are just acknowledging that you are in the room. We acknowledge that your words, your scripture is truth that is going forth. We acknowledge that it does not return void that lives can be changed by it if they choose to allow it to transform their mind, their heart, their soul. And we're believing today, Father, as we jump into this series and this first week of Anxious About Nothing, God, that we would focus on you, that we would change our perspective throughout this message and throughout the next couple of days to, Father, trust in you in every moment. In your name we pray. Everyone said amen. Now listen, the, the, the verse that's going to be driving this series or this today's message is going to be found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. But before we unpack that and open it up and talk about that verse itself, uh, I think it's important that we learn the context that is happening around this verse. It's going to make this verse that much more powerful. Philippians is a letter, and Paul wrote that letter. One of the great leaders of the gospel, the New Testament, Paul wrote the letter of Philippians. Um, and while he was writing this letter, there were things, a lot of things happening in his life, specifically at this moment in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4. We find him in house arrest, in jail. He's in prison. 
Like it's really, really bad. It's prison. Also, after some study, we recognize that he is, he is chained to an imperial, powerful, influential leader, a Roman guard. He is chained eight hours at a time, 24-7. He is in prison. It's bad. It's, it's real, real bad. It's terrible. And so we're unpacking that today. He is the writer, uh, but uh, one of his goals was to get the message of Jesus into Rome. Because if he knew he could get the message of Jesus into Rome, and he could get it into the hearts and the mind of those powerful, influential leaders, it could change a large part of the world. Now the problem is, as you just heard, he didn't make it there as a preacher, but he made it there as a prisoner. And he was chained, and this was the end. And I'm going to say this out loud because this is what I feel. If anybody deserves in this moment to be anxious and worried and full of doubt, it is Paul. He is, this is it. He don't know, hey, I'm here for months in on, I mean, I don't know what's happening. Are they going to cut my head off? Are they going to hang me? This is it. The, the, the doubt that must have been feeling that jail cell over and over, the anxiety. What's going to happen here? Because he was a human being, so I know that he battled those thoughts. He's in prison. He deserves to have anxious moments. He deserves to be scared. And this is what he says, because I'm not going to respond this way. This is a powerful verse. He says this in chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. That sounds like my mom. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always, and just in case you didn't hear it, <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. And it's like Paul's telling us, I know what my circumstance is, but I'm telling you, regardless, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, I say rejoice. That is such a good, it's a powerful verse. It really is a powerful verse. It's an easy one to remember, to memorize, to pass on to other people. I think it should go on a coffee mug. It would be great on a coffee mug or a magnet on a refrigerator or a greeting card. You know what I'm saying? Like if your friends are going through a really tough time, you can go rejoice in the Lord always. Paul was having a bad day. You can have a good one too. I know that it's terrible. Rejoice in the Lord always. But let me tell you something. If I'm having a bad day and you say rejoice in the Lord always, find me on the highway in 100 degrees weather and, and, and the car has a flat tire and the lug nuts coming off and you go, this looks terrible, but you should rejoice in always. All I'm thinking is you're about to go missing. That's all I'm thinking. <laughs> How dare you say rejoice in the Lord always? Paul, rejoice in the Lord always? That's a lot, man. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul. For real? Paul, have you seen gas prices, Paul? <laughs> Paul, I can't get to Montgomery without $60 in the tank. Paul, rejoice in the Lord always. Paul, for real, rejoice in the Lord always. Inflation is through the roof. Paul, I just lost my job. Paul, my marriage is failing. Paul, my kids are on drugs. Paul, I lost my job. Paul, I'm going to lose my house. Rejoice in the Lord always. Really, Paul? Really? He goes on to say this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The peace of God, which transcends, other versions say, what surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Always Rejoice. How can a man who is locked up to an imperial soldier, eight hours at a time, 24 7, months on end, how in the world can this man say rejoice? You were locked up. How can you praise God, continue to preach the gospel, write these letters when you are going to bed as a prisoner? How can you do that? Paul was teaching the people. Then, as he was writing these letters, and he's teaching us something 2,000 years later, my brothers and sisters, it is all about my perspective, is what Paul is saying. 
He is saying it is all about my perspective. I know, listen to me, please don't get this wrong in your mind that Paul's this crazy person that doesn't see reality of what's going on. He recognizes what is happening, but chooses in his heart, mind, and soul to give glory to God regardless of what's happening. Because whether you deliver me ever, or you whether you've delivered me ever before, you're not, if you may, you may never break me out of this situation. That doesn't matter. It's not going to change who you are. It's his perspective of praise. It's all about your perspective. And I think that's what Paul wants to get to us today. It's all about our perspective. Now, you may not know this in that about me, but I'm a little bit of a negative Nancy. Um, sorry for the Nancys in the room. Um, I know that you already got like a negative. <laughs> like, sorry about that. I don't know how that got your name got associated with that. Um, but I can be. My job is the student pastor here, but also my job as a, as a pastor on staff is to be energized, excited about the vision, which I am. And that's my job is to be, hey, we're going to continue to move forward. Hey, we, we got this. God is, God is uh, he's in charge. He's leading us. But when I get home, sometimes I can be a negative Nancy. I've been married to my wife, Laura, for 13 years. We've been together for, for almost 18 total years. And throughout those 18 years, I have heard her say once, twice, 100 times, dude, why are you so negative? Oh, my gosh, why are you being so negative today? Look at everything around you. Why are you being so negative? And what's really funny is how I respond to her comments of negative. Why are you being so mean to me? I'm not being negative. Why would you say that? This is not negative. Why are you arguing with me? Have you not seen our middle child? She's crazy, man. I don't know what you're talking about. Why wouldn't you be negative? This is We don't have enough money in the bank. Oh, my gosh. Why are you not worried? <laughs> and then, listen, fellas, if you're in the room, fellas, fellas, <laughs> Sorry, country came out. Fellas, if you're in the room and you're married or you're engaged or you've dated a woman in any way, you have all got this look when you lose yourself and you go, why are you not worried? My wife often looks at me like, bless your heart. You're so dumb. Like, that's why I know what she wants to say, but she don't say it. And the fact is, is that my attitude and my anxiety going through the roof changes the atmosphere in my house because I have a wife and three babies that look at me to lead the home in a positive way, but not forget what reality is, but also not forget who my God is. And oftentimes I do that, and you probably also do that. So maybe we can connect on some level. It's all about our perspective. It's all about who and how we see who our God is and how we see him. And listen, perspective does not have some large definition that is three pages long. Perspective is simply put, it's how you see something. Perspective is how you see something. Here's the facts, is that two different people can see a certain situation and come out with two different outcomes, have two different results because of their perspective because of how they see the situation. Let me ask you a question. What if Paul would have wrote this letter of Philippians from another version of the Bible? Like, you know, there's NLT, NIV, KJV, all that, right? So um, what if he wrote it from the BPV? Now, some of you may go, and oh, that's not a version, or maybe you don't know, but it's, it's, I made it up, so it's not real. It's not a real version. It's the bad perspective version. Because here's the facts, is that I think that if I wrote this letter, I would probably write it from a bad perspective because I know who I am. I want that to change, and God is changing that in me daily. But if I was like Paul, and I found myself in prison, and I know that the end is coming, I'm going to give a bad perspective version when I'm writing this letter. Sometimes it would just seep through the pen. It would seep through the, 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 what I was writing. So let's say that Paul wrote a letter in first, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Let's just say this was the bad perspective version. A lot of what we do, let's see what would happen. This is what it says. This is made up. This is not the Bible. Please don't leave here and say that you learned that from us. It's not the Bible. But let's just say what happens. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really sucks. That God has let me down. I'm overwhelmed with anxiety, depression, and hopelessness. And because of the hell I've been through, I'm quitting church and never coming back. I'm never going back. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's, we may not say that verbally, but when you've had a bad day, you go, God, where are you, man? I went to church this week. I paid tithe. I served. What? what? 
what gives. We always have this bad, a lot of times we have this bad perspective version. And what if Paul led that way? Do you think anybody would follow him? Do you think that he would make the impact that he did? Do you think we'd be talking about him in this positive way 2,000 years later? I don't think so. But instead, listen to me. Instead, you need to visualize what is happening. You need to understand what's happening in this moment. He, this is it. He is in prison. He is shackled to an imperial Roman soldier with power and influence. Shackled. This is it. Eight hours at a time, 24-7. And this is what he says, instead of this bad perspective version, this is the real version, the NLT. This is what he says. He says, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened here to me helped to spread the good news, positive, pr perspective of praise, helped to spread the good news. I'm in shackles, but everything that has happened is because Christ is, in, this is, this is happening and God is working in all things. And so it's helped to spread the good news for everyone here, including the whole palace guard knows that I am in chains for Jesus Christ. Praise of, a perspective of praise. He didn't come at it from a perspective of anxiety like we do a lot of the times. What are we going to do? So much doubt, so much worry, so much anxiety. He says, nope, I know how God is. I know how big he is. I know how big is love, how vast, how wide it is for me. I recognize what he's already done for me. And so I'm going to focus on the positives here. God is at work. Sure, Paul could have been depressed. Sure, he could have had anxiety. Sure, he could have had worry. We already, we already established that he had the right to be that way. Dreams are shattered. Ministry over. I'm dying here. I'm shackled to a guard. This is going to be terrible. But instead, he chooses the perspective of praise. And I'm challenging you today to choose that perspective. Perspective of praise. He recognized that who his God was. He recognized that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. He recognized that in all things God works for good. That God is in control of this situation even though I feel like it's out of control. I'm going to lead from a perspective of praise. I'm going to lead from a perspective of praise. And here's what's written. Listen to me. Before we go any further, let's just do this. Let's read between the lines. Just leave this up for a second. Let's read between the lines of what's happening right here. Read between the lines because here's what I think Paul is saying. Paul is in prison, shackled to a guard. Paul could have gave in to anxiety and worry and depression and doubts, but instead, this is what he's really saying. You locked me in prison to shut me up and stop the advancement of the gospel. What you did not recognize you were doing is you locked me to an imperial Roman influential powerful soldier eight hours a time, 24-7. So now all I'm going to do is preach the gospel to him so when he leaves here, he's going to tell his friends and his family and his mama and daddy and they're going to learn about a savior named Jesus the world's going to be changed you cannot stop the advancement of the gospel Amen. you cannot stop it it's all about your perspective of praise it's your perspective Paul did not he wasn't he, he wasn't crazy to think this react this wasn't react hey th I know what's happening here but I'm going to choose a different perspective than what others might. Because I know God can work in every situation for good. Now, if we can turn back in time for just a second to the book of Acts, this wasn't the only time Paul has found himself in prison. Paul and Silas, on the way to the place of prayer in the book of Acts, and on the way there, they encounter this woman who is demon-possessed. And as they're doing ministry, she is pestering them over and over. She's becoming louder and more flamboyant and just really kind of messing up what God is doing in that moment. And so Paul, sick of it, casts the demons out of her. Now that's incredible. That should be the end of the story. He goes, she's new, she's different, Jesus changed her life. That's incredible. 
The power of the Holy Spirit has changed her. It could stop there. But it did not stop there because this is actually not a good thing for Paul and Silas. Because there were men in the city that owned this woman and they made money off of this possession. And now that she's not possessed anymore, she doesn't make money for them anymore. And they're really upset. And so they got all of their friends and the citizens in that town and they riled everybody up and they created a riot. And the gospel says that they beat Paul and Silas. And then the city officials came in. And beat Paul and Silas. This is what it says in Acts 16, 22. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. And the city officials ordered them to be stripped and beaten with wooden rods. And then the Bible says that they were thrown into the inner dungeon of a prison. Now, I don't know about you, but hopefully there's no one in this place that has been stripped and beaten with a wooden rod. Some of us got some country grandparents, I don't know. But I don't suspect it was this way, because this was flogging. They were beat nearly to death, bleeding, striped. I don't guess that you know how they feel. I, I wouldn't think that you know how they feel physically, but I bet you know how they feel mentally. Because there's people in the room, there's people watching right now that have been stripped of your peace, You've been stripped of your joy. You've been stripped of your trust in Christ because of things that have happened to you. You've been beaten down by anxiety, by depression, by worry, by doubts. Just think about this. Dream with me. For I, I visualize things. Dream with me in this moment. Paul and Silas in the inner dungeon. And just to kind of stop there and kind of give you some some context, inner dungeon of this prison, there's a reason why they're in the inner dungeon. Because it's the worst place in the inner dungeon, or in this, in this prison. The inner dungeon has very low airflow. There's very little light. It is disgusting. It is nasty. They are chained and shackled to the wall. It is over. They had left for They were also just beaten. And when I say beaten, I don't mean just like whipped with a belt. They had probably cracked ribs and bloody nose and black eyes and, and, and broken bones. They were wrongfully accused and violently beaten. They are left there on a prison floor, cold, full of... And, and listen, again, if anybody in this moment in this world deserves to feel or could feel anxiety and depression and worry and doubt right now, it's Paul and Silas. They can do that if they want to. Bloody, beaten, shackled to a prison wall, left in the inner dungeon. Instead, they choose the perspective of praise and say, hey, let's have a worship night. Let's have a worship night. I know that it looks really bad. This is reality, but we're going to have a worship night instead. They are living out a perspective of praise. This is what it says in verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Listen to me. Paul and Silas... In prison, in her dungeon, beaten nearly to death. And here's the important thing. No miracle has taken place yet. They are still in shackles. They don't know what's going to happen. They're believing in God, but there is no miracle that has taken place yet. And yet we find them, regardless of the situation, they say, I get what reality is, but I'm going to praise God regardless. Not only that, they recognize that if they praise God, everybody else around them has to hear what is going on. I'm going to choose my perspective of praise. I'm not going to be negative about this moment. Paul and Silas recognize that God is working in all things, not some things, all things for the good of those that love him. Why was Paul so confident? Why could he be so confident in Philippians? And say, rejoice always, because he remembered what was happening to him back in Acts. And he recognized that God was still in control then, and he's still in control now. He's the same God then, today, yesterday, forever. His love for me is big. His plan for me is big. He is in control of my life. I'm going to choose the perspective of praise. Paul was teaching us something, and we got to lean in and catch it today. 
It's a perspective of praise. I will choose a perspective of praise. This is an incredible moment because right here in verse 26, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. Suddenly, the prison walls began to violently shake. The prison was shaken to its foundation. All of the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. I need you to lean in and listen to me and help me this morning and be excited about what God is doing then and what he's doing in your life right now, even though you may not see it. Visualize what is happening. Paul and Silas, beaten, shackled, left for, uh, left for dead, broken, body hurt, Depression has filled this inner dungeon. Anxiety has filled this inner dungeon. The enemy is thinking it is over. Their ministry is done. No more for Paul and Silas. I have shut them up. I wonder what conversation, listen to me, I wonder what their conversation was like because it's not recorded. I wonder at midnight if Paul looked over to Silas and said, hey, Silas, Silas, I know, I know it's bad, but Silas, Jesus is risen. Hey, S Silas, Silas, we're not dead, so that must mean that we have purpose. Hey, hey, Silas, guess what, brother? God is still on the throne, and he still loves me, and he still loves you, and he still wants his mission to be accomplished through us. And so there is a reason to be excited today, Silas. Let's worship God. It's all about your perspective of praise. It's all about your perspective. Here's what I need you to know. You cannot any long, you can no longer go through life expecting things to change, expecting your marriage and your children to change if you continue to see everything from a negative point of view and act like God is not in charge of your life and he gave you the gospel to lead from. God wants to do great things in you, and I get that it's difficult, and the reality is you may get up every single day and look in the mirror and go, what is God doing in me? How could God use me? But I need you to understand, if there is breath in your body, there is purpose for your body, and you need to recognize that living in anxiety day in and day out is not God's plan for you. It's not God's plan for you. We're going to go into a moment of worship. In just a second. And our prayer team is going to be up front. And I would challenge those in the room that are dealing with anxiety right now. To run to them. Get to them. Let them pray with you. Talk it out for a few moments. But I'm also challenging you as we jump into a moment of praise. To not worry about what's happening around you. Not worry about, hey, I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I need you to worship God from a perspective of praise. Because God is deserving of that. Can we stand to our feet for just a second? Can we close our eyes? All across this building, I need you to hear me. Close your eyes and visualize what is happening in this prison. Continue to see Paul and Silas singing and worship to God because they're in a hopeless situation and it doesn't matter because they, knew who, they know who God is. They were leading from a perspective of praise. And suddenly, the doors flew open and everybody's chains fell off. Here's what I need you to know. There are people in this room that are searching for a miracle. You're searching for a miracle in your life. You're searching for a miracle in your future. You're searching, searching for a miracle in your finances. For for your children, for your marriage. And here's what I need you to know is that maybe the key to unlocking your miracle is going to be found in changing your perspective. And you can change it right now, today. You don't have to wait three days. You don't have to pay $9.99, seven payments. God's salvation is free. His freedom is free to you today. Listen to me. Lead with Paul. It's not if he breaks me out. If he breaks me out or not, I will pray him regardless I will worship him regardless no matter how I feel no matter how I see no matter what is happening to me I'm gonna choose perspective of praise today come on journey church let's praise this morning come on